Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. Today we're going to be checking out the integral, the definition of an integral. So I have the pretty basic definition right here. Uh, we're going to go over how to derive that and also how to use it. So we're going to be doing a few pretty uh, simple integrals that would usually be super easy, but we're going to be do use them without using antiderivatives and only uh, using uh, the definition of integration. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So for this video, we're only going to be concerning ourselves with the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. And uh, you can transform pretty much any other integral into the integral from 0 to 1, except for improper integrals, uh, but we won't dive into those quite yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider uh, integration to be finding the area under the curve, which is one of the very common definitions of integration. So if we look at f of x from 0 to 1, you know, it's going to be some function. I don't know what it's going to look like exactly. Let's just say it looks like this. And we want to find the area. And the way we do this is we split this up into n different subgrids. So, for example, I can split it right here and right here, right here, right here, so on and so forth, blah, 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 n times. So there's n segments. And the idea is if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, the width of these segments gets incredibly small, and as these segments get incredibly small, the area of each segment approaches, or the shape of each segment approaches a perfect rectangle, since the function doesn't change very much from each side of the segment because the segments are super small. So the area of each segment, since we're splitting up into n segments and we're looking at the area from 0 to 1, the width right here is going to be 1 over n. So we're going to be looking at the limit as n goes to infinity. And so the width of each segment is 1 over n. And the height of each segment depends on where the segment is located. So we're going to be adding up all the segments. Now the first segment, let's just uh, look at them from the left. So the leftmost side of the first segment is 0. We're going to use i as our dummy variable here. That's just convention for this type of thing. And then we're going to add up lots of different segments, right? So in total, we're going to have total of n segments. And so that means the last segment is going to be n minus 1. And that's this last segment over here, where the leftmost um, point of the segment is at n, um, n minus 1 over n. Right? And then what goes in this sum? Well, it's just the height of the function of that at that point. So that's just going to be f of i over n. One thing that I do want to note here is that this is uh, if we use the definition um, of a, using a left Riemann sum, meaning um, our rectangles are being used from the left right here. And that's where our, where our rectangles are defined. So if we look at some function, we're going to be defining the height of our rectangles from the leftmost point rather than the rightmost point, like sort of like this. If you wanted to do it as a right, re, right Riemann sum, you would just shift this over by one. And truly, it doesn't actually matter which one you use because uh, the change in those one or two terms, since we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, won't matter because we're only doing proper integrals in this situation. So let's go ahead and see how we can use this to evaluate a few pretty simple integrals. So the first one we're going to be doing is the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx. Now, the trouble here is... I feel like I've done this integral before. The only problem is I can't remember the power rule. Oh no! So what should I do? I'm going to use the definition for integration. So this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of, now f of, f of i over n is just going to be uh, where f of x is x squared, so that's just going to be i over n squared. If I go ahead and simplify this, this becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed times the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of i squared. In order to evaluate this, um, we need a formula, and that formula is the sum from m equals 1 to uh, k of m squared, which is actually just equal to k 
times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 all over 6. And there's a few different ways to prove this. I'm not going to prove this right here, but this is just a handy formula just to remember. And so if we go ahead and plug that in right there, limit as n goes to infinity. Now notice that uh, we're actually starting at i equals 0 here, but that doesn't matter because that term is just equal to 0. So if we go ahead and plug this in, this is going to be n minus 1 times n times 2n minus 1 all over 6 and cubed. Now, uh, all that matters right here is the leading term. So if we were to multiply out the most important terms here, we'd find that the leading term would just be 2n cubed. Since we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity, only the leading term is going to matter. And so overall, our answer is going to be 1 third. So that's a pretty straightforward example. Now let's jump into a little bit of uh, some more difficult examples. So for this first one, I'm going to be finding the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the x dx. The only problem is, I can't remember what the integral of e to the x is. I know it's somewhere in there, but I just can't figure it out. So I'm just going to use the Riemann sum definition. So we're going to use the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of e to the i over n. In order to simplify this, we're going to change this into a little bit of a different limit, or a different sum and here. We're going to write this as e to the 1 over n overall to the i. And this is essentially a geometric series, but you can notice that it does not actually go to infinity. Uh, it only goes to n minus 1, so we're going to need to take that into account. So for the partial sum of a geometric series, there's actually a quite nice formula for this. The sum from n equals 0 to k of uh, b to the n is equal to 1 minus b to the k plus 1 over 1 minus b. And it's pretty simple to see why this works. If you just go ahead and do polynomial long division, um, you might it might be easier if you write it out backwards here. That might make a little bit more sense. Uh, the way I would be, I would show it is I would just uh, do b to the k plus 1 minus b to the k plus b to the k minus 1, right, over b minus 1. And then you would see that this would just be b to the k, right? And then you would have plus b to the k minus 1 over b minus 1. And this would be the sum from n equals 0 to k minus 1. And so there it's kind of an inductive reasoning there. I'm not going to go ahead and waste too much time on this, but this is going to be a very important sum for us to remember, and it's useful at many different times, especially because this sum actually works for any value of b, regardless of if it's uh, negative, positive, or it can its absolute value could absolutely be greater than 1. So if we go ahead and apply this to the sum, we're going to end up with the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n. Now, uh, as you can see, we're just going to have the last term plus 1, right? So it's going to be e to the n over n, because it's e to the 1 over n. So in this case, b is e to the 1 over n, and k is n minus 1. So k plus 1 is just n. So it's going to be e to the n over n, e to the n over n minus 1, which is just e minus 1, over b minus 1, so that's e to the 1 over n minus 1. So this part is just constant, and we can take it out of the limit. So it's going to be e minus 1 times this limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n over e to the 1 over n minus 1. Now notice as n goes to infinity, the top goes to 0, the bottom also goes to 0. So let's use the hospital's rule. On the top, we're just going to end up e to the negative 1 over n squared. And this one, we're just going to end up with e to the 1 over n times negative 1 over n squared. These are going to cancel with each other, and we just have e to the negative 1 over n, which as n goes to infinity, just goes to 1. So overall, this limit's just going to disappear, and our answer is going to be e minus 1. So that's our answer. And if we go ahead and check that using normal integration, it would match up perfectly.
All right, our final integral for today is going to be uh, a little bit more interesting. We're going to be integrating from 0 to pi sine of x dx. And if we did this doing the normal method, we would end up with negative cosine x evaluated at pi and 0. So we would end up with 1 minus negative 1 equals 2, right? But let's just pretend that I could not figure out for the life of me that the integral of sine x is cosine x. Now, this is a little bit more difficult because we're integrating now from 0 to pi. And there is a very easy way to convert that sum, but I just want to... Uh, I don't want to have to go explaining all that, so I'm just going to go ahead and convert this into a, an integral from 0 to 1. So I'm going to let x equal pi u, dx equals pi du. So we're going to end up with pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of sine pi u du. All right. Now, in order to do this integral, we'll just go ahead and apply our limit definition. And in case you haven't figured it out yet, the way that we're going to evaluate this is going to be pretty simple. We're going to write sine of pi, ooh, this is going to become a problem. Okay, so usually we use i in order to denote um, the, uh, just as our dummy variable here, but I'm going to actually change it to k because we're going to be using imaginary numbers. So we'll write this as pi k over n and k equals 0 to n minus 1. So we're going to rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n times the sum from k equals 0 to n minus 1 of the imaginary part of e to the i pi k over n. And this matches up with this right here. And since this is a sum, I can go ahead and interchange this imaginary right here and bring this outside. And now, all we have to do is evaluate this inner sum and then find the imaginary part and evaluate the limit. So we can do this in the exact same way we did the last sum. We just have to remove this k and do this like this, raising it to the kth power. And so then our limit is going to become the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n times the imaginary part of... All right, so on the top, we're going to have e to the i pi n minus 1 plus 1. n minus 1 plus 1 is just n. So e to the i pi n over n, which is just e to the i pi, minus 1, over uh, our ratio, which is e to the i pi over n minus 1. All right. Now e to the i pi is nothing but negative 1. So this is just going to become negative 2. Let's go ahead and make some more space. All right, in order to make this a little bit easier, I'm just going to bring this negative sign and flip this on the bottom. It's going to make everything simpler for us. Now we're going to go ahead and expand in order to evaluate, uh, in order to rationalize this and figure out what's the imaginary part. I'm going to expand this as cosine and sine. Next, we're going to multiply by the conjugate, which in this case, we're going to multiply on the top and bottom inside here by 1 minus cosine pi over n plus i sine pi over n. And on the top, we're actually only going to worry about this because this part will be real, and so we don't need to worry about that. So we're going to end up with the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n times 2 sine of pi over n, because we're just looking at that imaginary part. And on the bottom, we're going to end up with this squared plus this squared, right? So that's going to be 1 minus 2 cosine pi over n uh, plus cosine squared plus sine squared. And cosine squared plus sine squared of pi over n is just going to be 1 as well. Then we can go ahead and cancel all these 2s. So we're just going to end up with this. <laughs> okay, in order to evaluate this limit, we're going to again multiply by a conjugate. And on the bottom and top, we're going to multiply by uh, 1 plus cosine of pi over n. And that way, we will end up on the bottom with uh, 1 minus cosine squared of pi over n, which is the same as sine squared of pi over n. 
All right, now we can go ahead and cancel sign on the top and bottom. And now, as you can see on the top here, we have just, uh, this is just going to go to two, right? So I can just rewrite this as two because one plus cosine pi over n is n goes to infinity, pi over n goes to zero. So this is just going to be two on the top. And then we have this pi over n and sine pi over n. So as n goes to infinity, pi over n is going to go to zero and also is sine pi over n. But the interesting thing is if we let pi over n equals theta, we have a situation where it's theta over sine theta, right? But as n goes to infinity, theta goes to zero. So we have the limit as theta goes to zero of pi or, or theta over sine theta. And that's the same as one over the limit as theta goes to zero of sine of theta over theta. And so overall, this part is just gonna go to one. So we can just ignore all that. And overall, our answer will be two which matched up with what we did when we did the integration. So I hope you guys enjoyed this sort of wackier video. Uh, I think it's important to know the definitions for these kinds of things and uh, be able to apply them whenever we can. And it's a good practice with sums and with limits in um, uh, doing these kinds of problems. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.